Thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to the Science-Based Nutritional Support for Prostate Cancer with Dr. Gio Espinoza. I am Dr. Holly Lucille, and we are coming at you thanks to Natural Partners Full Script. Dr. Espinoza, how are you? I'm doing great, Holly. How are you today? I'm wonderful as well. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. We're, I, we, you are, you know, I've always heard that um, when you have a niche practice, it's kind of cool, right? It's because people like, it's like, that's what you do. And you actually right. ended up with that, didn't you? <laughs> yes, I did. I, I think it happened somewhat by default, but I did. And I, and I tell you that I couldn't be happier. And I certainly, when I have students with me or when I uh, teach at any of the schools, I encourage them to find an area that they love and to pursue that area as opposed to being a general doctor. It's yeah. a rewarding. <laughs> it, it, it's rewarding to it's rewarding to patients uh, because they want to know that you've seen a lot of what they have, and it's rewarding to other colleagues who you can help and you can feel confident. You know, I get a uh, I get an email, a text, or a call from a colleague almost every day from anywhere around the country, if not around the world, who's you know they have this prostate cancer patient coming to their office. They have a guy with prostatitis, guys with low testosterone, whatever. And, and they're asking me, hey, what do you think, you know, and so on. So you can really help the profession quite a lot by uh, you know, having a niche and having a, a specialized focus. Yeah, that's excellent. And congratulations. And thank you for the work that you do. Because as a naturopathic doctor, which you are, um, we have somewhat of an extensive and robust education. It's quite general. I used to say that we might be the expert generalist, in a sense. <laughs> um, yeah. But you did, uh, you did sort of drill down and get into that niche. But let's start off with me asking you, because I love this question, and I love when people ask me, because I love to tell the story. How did you get involved in the studies of naturopathic medicine? So, um, so you know, when I was doing my pre-med work at, in college, uh, I fell in love with natural medicine. You know, so I'm talking a long time ago, right? So there's no internet at the time. Uh, so it's not like you can Google anything. And, but I fell in love with natural approaches. The irony is that my father was having a lot of prostate issues and mm. you know, a lot of the drugs that he was consuming. Yeah, so it was an irony there. Of course, I had no intention of going into urology or men's health or even naturopathic medicine at the time when I first, but you know, I was overweight. I remember junior year in college, pre-med, stressed out of my mind, low energy, not feeling well. And, you know, I took matters into my own hands. I went to health food stores. I mean, a health food store, that was um, something strange to me. Um, you know, back then, again, there's no Whole Foods in every corner. There's the dingy health food store with the black cat on top of the counter, you know, dusty shelves with some dingy, you know, dirty looking supplements. Those independent and... stores are amazing, though. I have to tell you. <laughs> I don't well, want them to go away. Not at all. Not at all. Um, but you know, you compare that to all the health food stores and the whole foods that you have now and other types of, uh, similar stores, it's like, wow, night and day. you never thought that something could be, you know, grow so, so, so much within time. So anyway, I went to those stores and quite honestly, yeah, I felt, I felt in love with those stores. Uh, uh, I kept going back, looking at different herbs, buying books after book after book. Then I was like, man, I like this natural medicine stuff. God, I would love to be a doctor in some sort of natural medicine. And so then um, a trip to the library, when I started looking at different professions, um, I, I found naturopathic medicine. At the time, there was only a couple of schools, uh, you know, Bastyr and Southwest and National. And uh, I was like, look, I'll do whatever. I fell in love with everything I read. I visited a couple of those schools. I was like, wow, I really love this. And then I just shift gears and decided to go into naturopathic medicine. And then I decided to stay here in the, in the Northeast and go to, to the University of Bridgeport, which I'm very happy that I made that decision. That's excellent. Now, and then tell me, you have continued your uh, studies and then have been, uh, that's my assistant, Sydney. She'll be in uh -huh, and out of <laughs> the webinar for the next hour. But because we're, we're going to get into the meat of our, our subject, which is, you know, the science based supplement. Uh, aspect of prostate cancer and all that you do. But talk yeah. to me about your, your work in functional medicine now. 
Well, um, faculty with the uh, Institute of Functional Medicine, I'm very happy to say, is a prestigious position. Um, and, um, you know, I went through the whole course load, took the exams and uh, became certified. And then, you know, there was there seems to be an interest and a need for uh, an expert in urology and men's health. So I became faculty there. I teach the male hormone module uh, and the male hormone sexual of, uh, of the AFMCP course. And quite honestly, it's it's great. Um, as you know, there's a couple of naturopathic doctors there, a few that run the, the, the institute. And it's quite, it's a privilege and an honor to be part of that organization. That's great. I mean, I have to say one of my favorite Facebook memes is um, the one that says naturopathic medicine doing functional medicine before it was cool. <laughs> That's true. Look, a lot of the, 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 the basic comp concepts and tenets are, in, are naturopathic medicine. There's no question about that. Um, it, it's a, it's, I think functional medicine does a great job in terms of organizing things a little bit better for us so we can practice it. And look, it's layer learning as well. Some of the things like, oh yeah, that's right. I learned this in naturopathic medicine. Um, so that, that, that's right. Uh, a lot of the founder, Joe Pizzorno is one of the, you know, has been uh, involved since day one. Uh, and he's one of our forefathers. So, uh, I, look, I think we, I think we're all on the same team and, uh, Quite honestly, it's um, a lot of naturopathic doctors ask me they should pursue that, and I think sure if they if they don't mind uh, you know spending a couple of extra dollars and more coursework. I think it's great. Awesome. So listen, when you were going through your studies uh, in pre med and naturopathic medicine, you mentioned that your father was having urological issues. <clears throat> that wasn't what got you into your urology sort of niche. What did? How did you get into those studies? And to follow up on that question, what are the most common conditions that you see? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> you know, sometimes the life <clears throat> or the universe or God, depending on your beliefs, tells you exactly what you need to do. And you just need to have the awareness to listen and follow through. So, you know, I, I grew up hearing about the prostate since I was like 10 years old, again, with my dad, who always had prostate issues. I, the irony is, the other irony is that his best friend was a urologist. And back in the 1980s, as a urologist, he took some coursework in acupuncture and did acupuncture for urological conditions. This is the 80s. Everybody thought he was a quack, but he was getting great results. And again, I, I paid no mind to it. I didn't even want to go to medical school at that time. The other thing is that I have a very strong family history, paternal family history of prostate cancer on my father's mm -hmm. side. <clears throat> so he was always concerned about prostate cancer, getting it. He thought it was only a matter of time. It was, if there was ever some blood in his urine, he said, okay, this is it, I know I have it, and so on and so forth. So between BPH, uh, urinary problems, and the fear of prostate cancer, this thing was always on my mind since you know, way before since I was a kid. Of course, again, I paid no mind to anything like that other than I think my father was, you know, nuts with this urinary thing and his prostate thing. Later on, I found out that, no, he had a good, you know, he was really suffering. I become a naturopathic doctor, or at least during that coursework, you know, you know, we have to do several, hundred, you know, uh, 1,200, 1,500 hours of clinical work. And I attracted a lot of guys. I just attracted a lot of guys. They wanted to see me. I want to see, you know, Gio Espinoza. All right. I paid no mind to that, quite honestly. Um, mm -hmm. I said, look, I, I'm a naturopathic doctor. Uh, you know, we don't specialize. What are we doing specializing? Uh, we treat the person, not the disease. Uh, if in doubt, treat the gut. And all these mm -hmm. important principles that are, you know, truly a great part of how I practice today. So then uh, I was living in a building that had about eight, 24 floors at the time. And I played volleyball with this group of guys. One of them lived in my building. Long story short, I'm, I'm in my third year naturopathic school, um, 6.30 in the morning. I'm getting in the elevator to go down to for my eight o'clock class. It was about an hour and a half drive. Go down to my car. I forgot a book. So I had to go back up, which was you know, now I'm late for this class. I'm always late for that class. So that was the joke that I was always late for this eight o'clock class. I come back down, I see the guy that I play volleyball with and he says, hey, Gio, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to school. What do you, what do you go to school for? I'm gonna, you know, naturopathic medicine. It's like, oh, wow, great. Why don't you come to my office? I'm a urologist. 
and you know do some coursework because because I, I think my community would love what you do and that's how it all started well uh, this is dr valenzuela very amazing now he works for mount sinai faculty at mount sinai here and uh, he had a private practice and i started working with him with his in his community and i, I got a lot of uh, clinical hours there and um i just became fascinated with the field of urology shortly after a year after i went to dr aaron katz at columbia university department of urology uh, gave me an opportunity to do a internship fellowship uh there uh, at, the, at the center for holistic urology and that was it uh shortly after that was uh over i got a uh a, a position at nyu and nyu langone and here in new york as uh you know in integrative and functional urology and i became fascinated i never looked back and um how many what kind of diseases do i treat i i treat about seven conditions yeah now, tell me about them and, and give me some stats too about them because <laughs> wait, before you go on i'm gonna i'm gonna give you a break there um I love that story, and because I tell all of my mentees and, and folks, you know, prospective students or new docs, um, it is so important. Like you get to get myopic about this stuff, uh, about who you are, what you feel like, you know, and you just listen. And um, that story is just so perfect because I do think that life happens, and you have to trust it. I mean, I think right. that by the time you're in the medical school, no matter how or any uh, program, no matter how old you are you have earned faith that your life happens and so if you're just paying 100%. attention if you're just um uh you know the fact that volleyball uh and a conversation and forgetting a book like i just got a little bit of goosebumps <laughs> right that, that, that led you to this and then and then we all get to benefit from it because of it so just a shout out to folks that are, are watching if you are a, a, a young student or a new doc that this you got to let this happen and it's all yours and it's not about um the profession it's about who you are and your life and just let that happen so all right i want to know about the conditions and give me some stats about these conditions because we're going to get into the meat of all of this because there's tons of things that you have to share right right yeah um let me just add on to the fact that um even throughout, uh, just to add on to what we were talking about before, even towards the end of my clinical training, I was still resistant. I wanted to do weight loss. I wanted to do general, you know, the few women that I saw in in clinical practice during my training, actually, you know, I had a good relationship rapport with them and I, and I was just resistant until that moment where I met a Valenzuela in the, in the, uh, in the elevator. And I was like, okay, it's like, bap, idiot, pay attention. This is what you need to do. And it's the best decision I've ever made in my life, other than marrying my wife. Yeah, it's called staying in present time. I hear you. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. So, um, so the, the conditions that I treat, and by the way, I always before I'm I'm, I'm called out a sellout and things like that because I'm treating conditions and not people. I'm always treating people. I'm always treating the gut. I'm looking at the at the person. I never have a prostate coming to my office alone. I typically have a person, a man with a prostate coming to my office. So, and I always keep the, these things in mind, of course, and, and one has to, I mean, particularly if you practice what we practice. Um, the kinds of things that I treat are all prostate conditions. So this, uh, primarily prostate cancer. So some people, you know, I get calls for brain cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer. People think, you know, they find me at the um, Onc AMP website and they think that I'm a, a integrative or naturopathic oncologist. I am not, I do prostate cancer right that's it that's it that's the only onco oncological work that i do with the addition of some bladder because it's urologic oncology as well um so i do prostate cancer i do um i work with um men with uh prostatitis uh men with enlarged prostates that uh, have luts lower urinary tract symptoms as a result of their prostate or even if they don't have even if it's unrelated um then i deal with men with erectile dysfunction men with low testosterone and um men for you know just longevity uh, reasons and uh, the term that i hate to use but is anti-aging um that kind of stuff um with regards to um both women and men uh i treat overactive bladder uh nocturia so nocturia is interesting because that's becoming a disease of its own now uh it was looking at the so i know it was always um connected to either overactive bladder or bph and 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 then under that you'll see nocturia now it's becoming its own disease because mm -hmm. there's more mortality from men 
and women actually, but certainly men who have who wake up at night to, to urinate. Um, so sorry to digress there, but I just came across some interesting data. This I did some research this morning on nocturia. Um, and um, you know, I do I deal a little bit with chronic QTIs. I have a I have an interesting case that I think uh, you'd be interested. So, you know, um, I've <laughs> in my so I've I so not, about ninety five percent of my practice are uh, and my patients are men, and about five percent are women. Women typically with either interstitial cystitis or chronic uh, UTIs, right? So um, this one lovely lady comes in with a chronic UTI, and I said, hey, um, you know, let's do a you know urine culture and things like that, and then. She keep we keep talking and she's in a relationship. Uh, she's 30 years old in a relationship, um, more or less serious, not never been pregnant, never been pregnant. She tells me, you know, uh, but in passing that, hey, you know, I, I, my period is about three days late. And then she keeps going, you know, and my since I don't work with women that much, I don't pay, you know, that kind of goes over my head. This, you know, the menstrual cycle. I mean, I, has, I ask questions on my intake form, but quite honestly, I don't do a lot with it. So anyway, she tells me uh, uh, she tells me her, her her period is late. I said three days, no problem. Maybe it's just late. Um, we do other tests, um, and then she tells me that you know she's interested in having a baby. I don't. I paid some attention to that as curiosity, but nothing else. And then she mentions it again. I'm like, my God, I I think I have to do a pregnancy test now. I've done a pregnancy test about five times in my whole career. It's never been uh, positive. Yeah, positive. Uh, no, no, they've never been pregnant. So anyway, this just happened like last week. Uh, I said, I need to do this test. Bottom line is she like, well, we, we do the test. I don't even know where the test is in my office, but we had one as a urology office. Do the test. She's, and, and, the, and the nurse tells me she's pregnant. I was like, my God, I don't even know how to tell her. <laughs> like, so then I take her to the examination room and just to tell her, I said, look, you're, you're pregnant. She hugs me. She starts, you know, and it was just one of the most, the reason I'm mentioning it is because maybe for everyone else who's listening they get this experience all the time i've never told any person that they were pregnant any woman and it was just one of the most amazing things so she's like what do i do about my chronic uti or interstitial cystitis i said you're asking the wrong person you're pregnant i have no idea what you do now and i could tell you that so one of the things with interstitial cystitis is that when women get pregnant they do better so those symptoms go away yeah. Right. So, so it's almost like when women get pregnant, a lot of things go away. It's uh, <laughs> right. And I'm talking about chronic pel uh, pelvic pain, chronic bladder pain, and it goes away with the progesterone. I said, listen, you're pregnant. That is the cure. And with regard, you know, a little ginger is fine. That's all I know. And a good multi and honey, you're on your way. Uh, some vitamin D as well. Well, you know, knowing that you see about 95 percent of men, I'm sure that you probably have not had the experience of telling too many folks that they are pregnant. Um, so yet. we're pulling it back to the boys um, and prostate health. Yeah, yeah. Do you think, and I'm going to pull in some naturopathic medicine here, do you think what we eat or what men eat can affect prostate health? Yeah, by the way, it's still no November. That's why you see all this fuzz on my face. Um, oh, wait. Except that I'm, I'm going to get there. Yeah, yeah. We, we, so, so it's perfect that we're we're working with uh, we're talking about prostate health. Um, does diet play a role? Listen, we, it's 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 about time that we we call uh, uh, um, you know diet, lifestyle medicine. Diet diet is medicine, and it's real medicine. Is it connected? Absolutely, is connected. One hundred percent is connected. Research I came across today shows that the Western diet contributes to hypertension and BPH together. So it causes more inflammation, a Western diet, causing hypertension and urinary symptoms from an enlarged prostate. Prostatitis, you, you, a lot of these guys are eating these pro-inflammatory foods and they have a lot of pain around their prostate pelvic area. Of course it's connected. Prostate cancer, Eat, there's a, a great deal of data supporting that you eat better, you have a lower risk of getting prostate cancer. You eat better, you, even if you have prostate cancer, you have a lower risk of dying from prostate cancer. How does it you know, work? Many, yeah, go ahead. No, that's, you know, that's where I always come in and like, I care little about diagnosis most of the time. I mean, yeah, certainly yeah. it gives us coding on our super bills or a language that we can talk 
you know, with, but I care about the mechanism behind the diagnosis. What has that tissue gone through? What is going on? What's spurring that on? So what are your dietary recommendations for prostate health and also prevention of prostate cancer? <laughs> Listen, you know, the reason why specializing is important, of course, who cares about the diagnosis, right? But the reason why it's important is several reasons. 80% of the time, if you're if you're practicing natural pathic medicine, naturopathic medicine or functional medicine, the core of it, you're going to help the patient get better. There's a 20% nuance that actually is very important, I believe, and you want to be more specific in that area. Um, you want to know all the pharmaceuticals to know what side effects they have so you can counteract that or to use them if, if, in case they do need it. And yes, you want to have a you want to be able to have a conversation with your urologist in my world and say, hey, you know, talk their lingo, and then and then you know so that we can um, come to a, some sort of conclusion for the patient. So you know that's uh, uh, I think that's very important. All right, um, to your question, diet. What kind of diet is good for prostate uh, health? Here's the deal. If you look at what's the one health problem that contributes to almost every urological problem, right? That includes prostate cancer, prostatitis, erectile dysfunction, low testosterone, kidney stones. The one problem that's connected and associated to that is metabolic syndrome. If you treat Explain. metabolic syndrome, which is, of course, uh, these issues that are not directly connected to urological uh, organs, but it is connected because everything is connected. Uh, men with high lipids, uh, high triglycerides, high uh, LDL, low HDL, big waist, uh, waist circ circumference, um, hypertension, all these things. If you treat that, uh, insulin resistance, if you treat that, there is a 50 to 60, maybe 70% chance that your patient will overcome prostatitis, overcome BPH, overcome low testosterone, overcome or at least manage uh, prostate cancer, pretty much almost every urological problem, you get overcome erectile dysfunction. So treating metabolic, uh, 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 metabolic syndrome is key to treating any urological problem. So, and of course, treating metabolic syndrome foundational is diet. So. One of the things I want to bring up right now, uh, and then I want to get back to what you recommend, the diet you recommend for prostate health and also prevention of prostate cancer. But I got to tell you this, direct to consumer marketing, right? Right through my television, which yes, I do tend to watch sometimes. A little downtime, brain candy, you know what it is. And by the way, there was just a bolt of lightning and thunder here in Los Angeles, and it's so few and far between. So if all the lights go out, don't be surprised because we can't handle okay. much. But okay. listen, direct to consumer marketing, and it was playing off the uh, embarrassment of men getting erectile dysfunction medicine. So it's this whole thing is like, hey, nobody has to know. You can just get this direct to your door, and it's in a little black box. And I looked at it, and I'm like, yeah, but you're going to die of a heart attack in three weeks because the reason that you're having problems down there is probably because you're having problems right here. And so anyway, I'm not going to digress for that. But let's get back to dietary because as, as promised to our viewers, we want to get into evidence-based supplementation regarding prostate cancer. So talk to me about diet, especially when it comes to prevention of prostate cancer and as well prostate health. What are your recommendations? So I developed a whole program called the Capitalist Method uh, for prostate cancer, very specifically for prostate cancer. For prostate health, including prostate cancer as a whole, if you look at the data, if you look at clinical uh, experience, if you look at longevity, the best thing to do is uh, some sort of a Mediterranean diet, okay? okay? Mediterranean diet works very well for almost every uh, prostate uh, situation. Um, with regards to prostate cancer, it's sort of a combination of plant-based Mediterranean um, and just clean, good quality food. Uh, I call it a single ingredient diet, right? So it's just things with uh, your your assistant is behind you there. <laughs> How cute! So we so so <clears throat> so it's a single ingredient diet where you eat sim simple simple foods. 
um, um, you know, uh, you know, broccoli, you know, in prostate cancer, we focus a lot on cruciferous vegetables because that has a different compounds in them, indole three carbonyls or forophanes that have anti prostate cancer properties, for example. So we focus a lot on that. We focus on salmon specifically, not just fish, salmon. Um, it turns out, at least from my research, that salmon, uh, and because it's a nice colored fish, not too high in mercury, and of course from uh, from the uh, wild uh, from the wild waters, wild ocean, that it's it's very therapeutic for prostate cancer specifically. Um, a lot of nuts and seeds. Um, you know, the interesting <laughs> the interesting thing with rice, for example, is the following. Uh, you go to a restaurant and you say, hey, I'm going to eat healthy today. I'm going to capitalist diet. I'm going to eat really healthy. I'm going to eat brown rice with uh, spinach and fish, right? That's what a, something to that or chicken people do, but let's say sure. fish. The problem there is a lot of things. Spinach, extremely high in pesticides and herbicides, right? That's what's one of the dirty 15 in, uh, in a, a environmental working groups uh, list. Correct. The fish is farm raised. Problem there is high in BPA, not good. Brown rice. Brown rice, by and large, is very high in arsenic. Arsenic is a metal that contributes to many cancers, including prostate cancer. Right. So the so this is the typical person that's coming into your office and saying, "I don't, I, I don't get this. I eat healthy." The problem is that number one, we may not know what healthy is, and number two. We think we're eating healthy, but we're not. Right. So, so what do you do with this information? Eat white rice? I mean, what do you do? So the thing is this: um, there are some companies that have very low arsenic levels, um, and then like uh, Londonberg, for example, I have no financial association with them. Uh, um, Londonberg uh, Organic uh, Brown Rice. Um, you you don't want to have ever have spinach that's not organic. Interestingly right. enough, you can have broccoli or cauliflower if it's not organic because it's not on the list in terms of the highest in, in pesticides. And fish, eat fish, is not the best fish. There's nothing there from a, a animal source that is that good. So eat the fish. And that's why I'm a huge proponent of supplements. You know, every now and then I get tagged on, on social media because uh, I say something about supplements. And some people, you know, you have the only food group that think or believe that food is the only thing you need. And I couldn't disagree more. We're gonna to get um, to that right next. So I, I right. appreciate that because, so what you're saying is basically the, um, the average person who comes in, not average, I don't mean to say that in any way, but when you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna clean my diet, brown rice, yeah. salmon, <clears throat> and a little bit of vegetables, right? Some spinach on the side, that's awesome. But you're basically like, hey, let me have my Mediterranean diet with a side of heavy metals, is what you're saying if you don't, understand that the devil is in the details in our modern yeah. day with all of our environmental influences. So I love that. So when diet is not enough, especially when people are thinking that diet is doing good, what are some of the common supplements you use when you're talking about your urological conditions? Thank you. Well, um, let me say this. Um, I, we have part, so I am, uh, uh, as a disclosure, I am a co-founder and formulator at XY Wellness is a men's health supplement company. And Excellent. I'm so excited. We just confirmed or not confirmed, we, we partnered with Fullscript Natural uh, Partners. And I couldn't be happier because Natural Partners and Fullscript are just amazing people and they're a great company to partner with. So, uh, I, you know, I thank everybody who was, who's been involved in that uh, with, with us at XY Wellness uh, and so forth. So I'll say that. So listen, you take, for example, vitamin D3. There's a plethora of research indicating that vitamin D3 is a good thing for the most part. Vitamin D3 is a good thing for prostate cancer as well. Uh, so you lower your risk of dying from it. People that are, have low levels typically die more often from um, prostate cancer than not. Overall mortality, people die more when their vitamin D levels are low. You cannot get that much vitamin D from the sun because we just don't spend that much time out there. It's possible. Look, if you wanna say, Hey, we only need food and only nature. Cool. I'll, I'm with that. So that that means what? That means the food is local and organic all the time, 100% of the time. That means that you're spending a lot of time outdoors. That means that you're exercising about four hours a week with moderate to high intensity. Somebody may be doing that. I have not met that person, right? 
So you need vitamin D and you need vitamin D from supplementation. Now, here's an interesting thing. BPH LUTs, lower urinary tract symptoms from BPH in a large prostate is worse in the wintertime. <clears throat> Why does that happen? I don't right. know, but there's been associations with low vitamin D, D levels in a winter time and these BPH symptoms. So you want to take vitamin D and you want to take them year round and you want to up that dose in a winter time when you're probably less, uh, your patient is probably less, uh, spending less time outdoors. Okay. So typically I have my patients taking two to 4,000 units a day um, throughout the year. I raise that to about five to seven units a day and I test it with blood work. I just see, I just want them to hover around, you know, 45 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. And that's okay. where I'm, I'm happy there. Curcumin. Listen, for curcumin for prostate cancer, it's the real thing. You look up curcumin in cancer, you're going to have 500, if not more, articles. I've lost count now. I mean, how much information, scientific information does one need? It does many things, including reducing inflammation by reducing this uh, mark biomarker uh, that induces inflammation, NF-kappa B. Um, it yeah. seems to have anti-cancer properties by itself. And I'll tell you this, my, uh, my uh, stage four prostate cancer patients with bone metastasis who sometimes have pain, I raise their curcumin uh, and it also serves as a pain reliever so, th so that these patients don't have to go to the bigger guns like opioids and things like that. So I do four, six grams a day. One of the things that um, I will say about curcumin and because I've sort of been called out myself, it's like you use curcumin for everything. It's like, it just must be your thing. And I'm like, listen, if you look at pharmaceuticals for the most part, um, let's say a COX-2 inhibitor, it touches one molecular target in our body, the COX-2 right. enzyme. Right. If you look at the molecular targets that curcuminoids, okay, the active ingredient in, in curcumin, turmeric, touches, it's over 100 molecular targets. And that is why uh, the, the research is there that anything from psoriasis, prostate cancer, and we can go on and on and on. Yeah. This is yeah. evidence-based about, and, but it's because of the mechanism of action and the molecular targets that this particular compound of this plant are able to touch. And it's very interesting to talk that way and to explain it to our patients because, you know, oh yeah, you just use curcumin for everything. Kinda, but not willy-nilly <laughs> and not for no reason. Here, here's, a, here's the deal here. We have an opportunity as naturopathic and functional medicine doctors to be very specific. Not only, hey, everybody's using curcumin, it's not all that everybody's using curcumin. I use a lot of curcumin. Is getting the dose right of everything. So getting the dose right in everything that we prescribe, getting the dose right in the exercise program that we prescribe is not just go exercise or get on the treadmill for four hours. Or, you know what kind of exercise? Uh, so we have that opportunity certainly with supplements. My dosage with supplementation depends on on what stage of prostate cancer they're in. It could go from 800 milligrams a day to 6,000 milligrams a day, depending on what stage and grade of cancer or prostate cancer they have. I give curcumin to my prostatitis patients. I give them to my BPH patients. Pretty much everybody's on some sort of curcumin. What are the things? Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Gio, if I could interrupt real quick. Um, I'm getting some questions in from our webinar, and I'm going to throw one at you. And it has to do with curcumin. If you can answer it, it would be awesome. Can you address any drug interactions with curcumin? Um, the J Julia Hall says she hears about this frequently. <clears throat> Listen, um, the only thing um, uh, uh, that I am somewhat concerned with, not, not, not a whole lot, is with blood thinners. Um, curcumin it can be a blood thinner in itself. Mm -hmm. And I have some uh, concerns, particularly now with Eliquis as a drug that people are using because they Correct. don't measure their, their INR as often as they did with Plavix, for example. They measure their INR weekly. So I had no concerns with fish oils and curcumin, even though they were on Plavix, because their INR was me measured uh, and, 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 and that could be monitored and scaled back. So with Eliquis, I have concerns. These are theoretical concerns, quite honestly. So I do have them on curcumin, even if they're on Eliquis, but it's more like 800 milligrams. I don't go as high as 4,000. Pretty much that's my only concern. And surgery, pre-surgery, 
Um, I have I take them off a of curcumin if they're gonna if they're gonna undergo surgery. However, hear hear this: there is research to support. Hold on to your seats. Hold on to your seats. There's research to support that if you use curcumin while undergoing radiation for prostate cancer, it is actually protective. Yep. There is less urinary problems. And and, uh, and 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 it might even help the radiation do its work better by having these cancer cells become more radiosensitive. Why is that a big deal? It's a big deal because when I ha get a patient in my office who's about to undergo radiation for prostate cancer, they're telling them, stay off all supplements. Stay off. I gave a talk to a group of radiation oncologists and I was like, okay, I need to have my guns loaded and I need to be ready to fight. These guys are gonna chew me up. Somebody from Sloan Kettering, they're a radiation. I was like, all right. So I presented only evidence-based information why some supplements should be included during radiation uh, during radiation treatment, not excluded. And there should be no worries is a theory and is a bad theory. At the end of that presentation, even the guy from Sloan Kettering said, great presentation, you know what? I'm not going to discourage my patients from taking supplements anymore during radiation. But you know, I have to. I, I want to mention a point about that because I have this conversation with my patients all the time who want to bag on their radiologists, who want to bag on their conventional medicine doctors, and I don't let it happen because yeah, I respect the fact that they were taught to think in a particular way. It's their scope of practice. Yeah. They don't know, therefore, they don't know, and it's not their fault. They work in a very much reductionistic system of medicine, which saves people's lives in 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 in, in many cases. One hundred percent. What I tell my patients is that listen, there's the second opinion. There are people that have different scopes of practice, that have more comprehensive scopes of practice, that can answer these questions. And I kind of put it back on my patients in a sense. We don't want to be dogging anybody, right, or bagging anybody because well, my doctor didn't say that. It's not their job. Their job is to radiate that that cancer that you have, period. That's what they were meant to do. So it's, it's about our, our being able to be advocates for ourselves and encouraging the patients to get second opinions. I just had to throw that in there because I get worried about it because I don't like my patients go, well, well, he didn't do this or he told me to do this. And I'm like, no, 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 baby, it is about you. And we're here, so we've just got to keep that going. Listen, 100%, and, and I, can, I appreciate, look, I have only have worked with medical doctors and urologists for the last 15 years. I've never been in a naturopathic medical group. I've never been in a functional medicine group. I am now in Stanford, but I've, I mainly have worked only with urologists. So I see what they do. I see the work that they do, and I see the, how, how well it works. Um, with regards to a patient that's about to undergo radiation, the conversation is simple. I present the information but I don't want to confuse the patient. So I don't want to, I don't want the patient to feel like, well, this doctor says this and that doctor, then they just confused. So I present the information. I send a letter to their radiation oncologist. Here's my research. If you take it fine, if you don't, we can get back on some of these supplements right after. But we were talking about curcumin and I just want to highlight that curcumin is one of the main supplements used in a study for, for while, a, while patients are undergoing radiation therapy for prostate cancer, curcumin, melatonin, and probiotics as well research is a good thing. If you want me to quickly tell you more, a couple of more sub, uh, ingredients, and then we're- Yeah, we're, so let's we're, just review. We've got vitamin D3 and, and, and optimizing those levels. You said 45 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. We've got curcumin right. across the board, probiotics. Um, take it from there. So melatonin is a good thing uh, for a, a nighttime use, about 20 milligrams a night. Um, there's more research on breast cancer than there is on prostate cancer. But So let me stop you right there, just mechanism of action, because I know folks are listening to you right now, and they're going to go, hmm, 20 milligrams a night, that's a lot of melatonin. Can you break that down a little bit as far as use for cancer? So it's been studied uh, for cancer in general, not necessarily for prostate cancer. That 20 milligrams seem to have some benefit there. Um, hmm. what they, what we've seen with prostate cancer is that, um, men with, men with prostate cancer typically have low levels of me melatonin metabolites, meaning they hmm. don't have enough melatonin in their, in their system. So the typical dosage for like, let's say sleep is like three milligrams more or less for, uh, one, uh, when somebody has cancer, whether it's prostate or any other 20 milligrams is the proper dosage. 
they're not going to necessarily feel more groggy when they wake up. If they feel groggy, they may feel groggy with three milligrams and and not only 20. Um, and the same thing with these nightmares. Some people get nightmares and things like that. Again, it, it won't happen unless it will happen with any dosage. Um, okay. So 20 milligrams is the way to go. A couple Great. of other ingredients that we do with uh, X Pro One is with and Fullscript that they have in terms of supplements is Boswellia. So Boswellia is a fantastic anti-inflammatory herb that most people associate it with joint pain and joint health. Because it's actually, of the action of the LOX2 uh, enzyme. Correct. Yeah. Right. Well, that LOX2 enzyme is also associated with inflammation and, and prostate cancer, as is NF kappa B and a few others, and and COX1 and two. So we, so Boswellia is an excellent herb for that. Modified citrus pectin. Um, some research suggests that it inhibits metastasis of prostate cancer. So you want modified citrus pectin. Um, uh, what, what I use about 1100 milligrams a day. You can use more, uh, but sometimes it could be a little tough on your, on your digestive system if, if you use more. Uh, I use grapeseed extracts. And one big study showed looking at 35,000 men that they looked at different supplements that they took and none of it helped to reduce the risk of prostate cancer with one exception, grape seed extract. So there seems to be uh, anthocyanidins and different polyphenols in grape seed extract that, that has anti-cancer properties. So I use grape seed extract. Green tea extract, um, I use quite a, a lot of that. One needs to measure liver enzymes. Liver enzymes do go up. If you Google search green tea extract and green tea, green tea supplementation and liver disease, um, you're going to find people that anecdotal information that says, um, I had it. I have liver disease from taking green tea extra. Again, that's not anecdotal and that's online, but it will increase. So you got to be careful and can't, you really can't go too high and you have to measure liver enzymes. Um, I, you, yeah. Um, typically people are low in selenium, particularly people with prostate cancer. So I use yeah. high selenized yeast selenium, not more than 200 micrograms a day. Um, if they do 200 micrograms a day on with supplements, and let's say they eat, you know, five Brazil nuts a day, uh, that will take their levels to like 400 micrograms. Again, no problem there. Um, there's no risk there. And the reason I say that is because minerals are tricky. Too high on most minerals can be counterproductive. Same with selenium. So if you take, you know, 10,000 micrograms of selenium, then you can start having problems. But at, you know, Dr. Gio, back to um, Boswelli, because I have a question coming in. Yeah. Um, dosage on selenium, got it, and you're right. You go too high, you're going to imbalance in other minerals, sort of pushing sand against the tide there. What about Boswellia? What's the dosage you recommend? Okay, so dosage I recommend, <clears throat> I'd recommend about 200 to 500 milligrams uh, twice a day. How do I decide with my patient? So, so my thinking process with my prostate cancer patient is the following. Patients with low, with low, um, low grade to intermediate grade prostate cancer, I put them in formulas with different ingredients, right? So it's like eight ingredients and several formulas that I use. Patients with high grade and bone metastasis, metastasis I use less formulas and more, more standalone um, supplements. Um, like curcumin, only curcumin, only boswellia, and things like that. Only sometimes mo even modified citrus pectin. The reason is because that's a more tricky situation. The pathophysiology of advanced prostate cancer is much more tricky than intermediate to low grade prostate cancer. So, and um, and and so then with boswellia, as an example, I would use more like 500 milligrams, even twice a day, sometimes on that advanced patient. That patient that's not advanced, I use about two to 250 milligrams a day. Great, thank you. Yeah. What else? So, so I we, while we're here, one more. Um, so, what about dosing on the green tea extract, especially with the caution of the liver enzymes? Right. And then, as well, um, should you co administer milk thistle, perhaps in a protective uh, sense, with the green tea extract? You took the words right out of my mouth. I was ready to go into milk thistle. Absolutely, absolutely milk thistle. You need a healthy liver to be cancer. You cannot be cancer without a health. You know, that's what made chemo a little bit difficult to, to be cancer because chemo 
is toxic to the body and toxic to the liver. So, so I use, I use milk thistle. So milk, if you use milk thistle, uh, you know, none of my patients ever had liver toxicity. It's probably because of the milk thistles, probably because my, the dosing. My dosing is about 500 milligrams a day to about a thousand milligrams a day. A lot of that depends how much green tea they consume as well. I mean, some of my patients, cause I tell them, look, green tea helps. And some of them are so motivated that they consume six cups of green tea a day. So that matters too. <clears throat> so I keep that into account. And again, I, I keep measuring the liver enzymes. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna give you a, a slow pitch right here, ready? Yeah. What combination product, this is a question from your viewers, do you prefer? What combination products I prefer? I, I For prostate cancer, what I call the one-two punch is uh, immunopectin and GD toxal. Again, disclosure, I formulated those uh, based on my experience and my research. That's so, why I said it was a little bit of a slow pitch. <laughs> it wasn't that slow, but thank you for the opportunity. So it's the <laughs> one-two punch. So so it has pomegranate, so pomegranate extract is another thing. So here's what you'll find. You'll find that PSA will come down, okay? This is in patients who are either uh, have prostate, prostate cancer, has not been treated, or it, prostate cancer was treated, but they are in this middle stage of a prostate cancer recurrence, meaning that the prostate cancer came back. But sometimes that situation does not uh, is, does not need further treatment. So what? So a bulk of my patients are patients who have not been treated, or they've been treated conventionally, but they have a recurrence of prostate cancer. So I. I use these two products, and I, there is nice stabilization of their PSA, ironically. Um, then I use an additional uh, vitamin D and additional AHCC. AHCC is another one. It is a Japanese mushroom that's pretty good. Okay. We've got about six or seven minutes left, so I've got a, another couple questions for you from your uh, lovely and, and smart, avid viewers. So one question here. Do you avoid testosterone boosters like maca in patients with prostate cancer? Man, they come in, they, they're loaded today with, with, with good questions. Man, no, I don't. No, I don't. So here's, this, here's the deal. Um, I'm trying to go with this in summary. All right, here's the deal. The, so pro, low testosterone does not contribute to prostate cancer development. In fact, low testosterone is associated with not only prostate cancer, but with advanced prostate cancer. So low testosterone is a problem with prostate cancer, okay? Now, somebody has prostate cancer already diagnosed, do you wanna increase testosterone? You wanna be a little bit careful there because this, that's a gray area, I don't know. While I can tell you, tell you that low testosterone is a problem and contributes to prostate cancer, if you've already been diagnosed, I don't know. Now, if you've been diagnosed and you're on active surveillance and you have low testosterone, can, can you raise it? And the answer is yes. If you have low testosterone and you had, and you had prostate cancer treated successfully, PSA undetectable for two years, and you wanna raise testosterone, can you do that? Yes, you can. So it, every case is different. With maca, maca will not increase testosterone that greatly in anyone. I use it. I think is a great herb. Or herb. Um, and it's, an adaptogen. it's an adaptogen. You know what? And it has. This, it, it's actually a, a cousin to all these cruciferous vegetables. Mm -hmm. So it has sulforaphanes and things like that. So maca, no problem. Don't worry about okay. testosterone increase. Use it, and and it is a, and it serves a it serves well. Okay, so. Uh, after these two questions, I want to move on from supplementation and we'll wrap it up. Um, somebody would like you to repeat the two combination products that you use. Just yeah. slowly repeat it. They're, they're tricky names, so I'll repeat it and spell it. So it's immunopectin, immuno, I-M-M-U-N-O, P-C-T-N. And the other one is GD Toxel. So the letter G, the letter D, T as in Tom, O-X-E-L. So GD Toxel, so there's detoxif detoxification and a balanced antioxidants in that immunopectin immunostimulatory herbs by the way my favorite mushroom based on science is reishi mushroom for pro for cancer for prostate cancer hey how about the others how about you know caviola and how about they are all good i think quite honestly all those mushrooms are good 
for okay, reasons so it seems it seems to have the the most science behind it. Um, you know, I love, and, I love congratulations because I love when combination products are put together at appropriate doses. Uh, because I think it makes it wonderful for the practitioner. I think it makes it super easy -er for the patients. Make it easy. Make it easy. Yeah. And if I had before XY Wellness, what I you know what I did and what I prescribed was like ten different, twelve different bottles. Yeah. If you put everything that they need back to specializing, this is your specialty. This is what you know to work. Then you can create different, unique things that can help patients. In two bottles, you have what I consider the one-two punch, plus you need a little bit of vitamin D in there, which it doesn't have. So one question about flaxseed oil. Is it good for this use? Flaxseed, flaxseed oil, no. Flaxseeds, yes. Okay. So flaxseed oil, seed. yeah, you want the seeds, not the oil, maybe because it's perishable, there's a, but there's the, the research I've seen is not, is not good for flaxseed oil. Let me tell you what that's, why that's a good question. There's a diet called the Ludwig diet, for prostate cancer, old German diet that people are doing. What they're doing is putting flaxseed oil into their cottage cheese, and that's what they're eating. They hate it, but they think they're doing a good job. You're not doing a good job. Don't do the Ludwig diet. Do more of a capitalist diet, Mediterranean plant-based. With appropriately sourced ingredients. 100%. There's no so other Popeye way. really should have been not eating spinach. Perhaps he should have been eating broccoli. Maybe Popeye's spinach was organic. I don't know, because those muscles were pretty big. They but were, the they bottom were. line, <laughs> those are big arms. <laughs> um, All right, okay. Yeah. What would be the number one prostate health message you want every male patient to take away from? The number one message is naturopathic medicine, functional medicine, lifestyle medicine is real medicine. I, I don't, I'm not saying that to say that you don't need anything else. I'm saying that, for example, with prostatitis, you want natural medicine because all you're going to get there from a conventional side is uh, anti, uh, antibiotics. And believe me, every urologist, if you become good at prostatitis, they'll send them all to you. They don't really want to see them. BPH, once again, vitamin D lower, uh, shrinks the prostate a little bit. I wrote a paper on that. And, and treat metabolic syndrome. If you treat the person and you treat metabolic syndrome, you can take care of at least 60% of these diseases. All right, so can, you know, you mentioned, thank you first of all so much for what you do because you know, here's the thing, not only are you helping us doctors in your niche specialty that you yep. stumbled upon, uh, thanks to volleyball and forgetting, your, <laughs> all right. uh, to you're educating the conventional doctors around you to be a little bit more open and expansive in their own referral base so they can encourage their patients to perhaps partner. That's true integrative medicine, I believe. Three, um, doing an awesome job at taking ingredients that, as we all know, 11, 12, especially when people get in the weeds with their health and have a cancer diagnosis, it's tough, but you've made dosage appropriate combination synergistic ingredients uh, that are going to make it easy, not only for practitioners to um, recommend, but also patients to stay compliant and adherent to. So let's talk about this whole Movember. Will you give me a little bit of a reminder about what that month is here in November? And, and, and quite honestly, I don't see you any differently. I mean, I've known you for a bit. And you look. You're right. You're you're absolutely right. It's no it's no different. <laughs> you're absolutely right. Uh, by the way, no. But I started leaving my facial hair about three years ago on November, and I was like, you know what? I like it. I'm not taking it off. So it started with November. So November. So November is Prostate Awareness Month, correct? No, November is Men's Health Awareness Month. And people, a lot of people think it's prostate awareness. Is testicular cancer awareness? Is prostate cancer awareness? Is mental health awareness for men? Because the suicide rate in amongst men is much higher than women. So it's it's mm -hmm. just it's a men's health general, but focus on prostate cancer, testicular cancer, and mental health in men. So, um, hang on, uh, our, our Cam the man keeps a. Um, so yes, Full Script actually has a. Uh, a Movember team. But I want to ask you a question. How can women get involved in this whole Movember? I mean, like, we love men more than anything. I was on Dr. So XM, Sirius XM, I was on Dr. Radio. It's here right at NYU yesterday the, on the Men's Health Show. And we had way more calls from women to a Men's Health call uh, a show than men. It was remarkable. 
So when so we, that's what, do we need to grow out something? Do we need to grow out our, like our chin hair, you know, that we have to manicure every day? Uh, when you get a certain age, do we need to grow out our li- like what what can we do to help? You know, you know, Halloween is a day before November begins, so you can just wear that beard for Halloween and just keep it for the rest of November. You're good. All right. Well, <laughs> all right, so one last question, and once again, thank you for being here. Thanks for doing all you do. Listen, folks that have um, been on the webinar, if your question did not get answered, I will make sure that we get it to Dr. Geo and that he has a chance to respond because I, I really want to respect your time and your interest in this topic. Um, so, Gio, you and I are Facebook friends. Uh, I Absolutely. think the, the time that we met each other was a couple years at, at, at IHS in New York. And I don't think we've yeah. ever physically met each other, but I think we've known each other in our circles <laughs> for so many years. So it was like, hey, hi. This is the first time we're ever meeting. Um, right. I see you often. Yeah. I think it's in your garage. Um, I'm a level yeah. two cross coach. And, uh, uh, you know, those who do any more teach, right? So I have left my numbers behind me. Uh, talk to me about your interest and background in Krav Maga and mixed martial arts and how you stay <laughs> from your family and Oh, man, that's great. All right. So. And you got um, two minutes to let you know because we are uh, wrapping up. Yeah, easy, easy. Krav Maga is, Israeli, is an Israeli form of martial arts. Is not a sport, is a street, is a, a defense mechanism to learn how to defend yourself in a war or in the streets. Um, so it's, it's like mixed martial arts, uh, but not as a sport to, you know, defend yourself against a one-on-one situation, a two-on-one, a three-on-one, somebody coming at you with a stick, with a with a knife, or a close range with a gun. So you learn how to defend yourself in all those type of situations. I just absolutely love it. Um, mixed martial arts, I, I've always loved combat sports. I've always loved boxing. I'm a boxing fan, and now I'm an MMA fan. So I started with doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Uh, and there's several reasons for that. Number one, I'm a very busy person. I'm a dad, I'm an involved dad, and I have a career. That's an easy way for you not to do something that's really important for you to do and give yourself an excuse. So because I was so busy, because it, and in spite of it, I said, I'm gonna do this. And I spoke to my wife and she's like, look, and by now I've been doing it for three years. She's like, you're a better dad, a husband and everything because you do that. So I do it all the time. And now you I'm in my garage. You put the proverbial oxygen mask on yourself first. 100%, 100%. And uh, in addition to that, uh, to that, I do weight training with kettlebells and barbells and things like that. So that, those are my two main forms of staying fit. And I train with my kids all the time. They have no choice. They have to, if they wanna talk to me about something that they want, uh, they need to uh, meet me in the garage gym and ask me there while they're training. All right. Dr. Gio Espinoza, thank you so much. Coming at you folks from Natural Partners Full Script. This is another webinar for your good. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Holly.